event. We're continuing with uh, yesterday's uh, uh, session on use and abuse of uh, indicators. Um, remember, yesterday we looked at uh, we we looked at a couple of, of concrete examples from out from outside our sphere. Um, concrete examples of plans, indicators, how they get done. Uh, we looked at uh, how, for instance, an Australian plan looks rather different from a Mauritian plan. And uh, my point was that this is this is this is actually part of a pattern. Uh, countries of different levels of development, for various reasons, actually have plans that look look fairly differently. I think some of those reasons are good. Some of those reasons are less uh, defensible. Um, now. What I want to do today is to um, look at some debates around the, uh, the use of indicators, indicator-based planning. Um, now, some of these uh, points are points that, that, that you may be very familiar with. These are things that you talk about over tea. Um, but what is probably new to most of you is, 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 is the literature, the sources. And it's always useful to know that, that out there somewhere, there are people who are actually formally analyzing this and analyzing the, the debates, the frustrations, the, the issues that, that, that you have to deal with. And sometimes that can be useful in terms of, of just defending certain positions that you take uh, in planning. I've arranged these polemics around five complaints but then I, what I also do is try and formulate a response to each of those complaints. Um, all right. So complaint one. Um, indicator frameworks, uh, these uh, uh, um, logical frameworks, uh, impose a structure that's too limiting and that prevents more creative thinking, including creative thinking using numbers. Um, they become a distraction rather than a, a, a facilitating tool. And this is something um, one hears a lot. I mean, you'll hear people saying, spending so much time trying to comply, you know, with filling in something in every one of these cells. I can't really think. I can't. I can't actually deal with 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 what's going on. Uh, the, the workload of, of just complying with this structure is, 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 is just overbearing relative to the capacity that I have. Um, right, have a look at that and that. Inbar is, is, is quite an interesting uh, uh, analyst. He's uh, one of the foremost writers at the uh, IIEP, International Institute for Education Planning, around Planning, I find his, his, his work very interesting. Um, he deals with, with issues that I think are very pertinent to developing countries. And have a look at that as well. I mean, my take on on this is, well, there's a word that comes to mind, and that's dashboards, um, which is something that, that you've probably come across. It's a very popular concept. Um, a dashboard uh, is, it, it, it draws from, like, aviation or, or driving. Uh, a dashboard is, 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 is a is a panel which tells you in, in, in a very rational fashion 
what is happening with your sector, almost as if it were a kind of machine. Um, and this, this is a very, very popular concept. But there's also a lot of controversy around it. Um, some of you may be familiar with um, the, the presidency's POA uh, uh, system, uh, where you have, for instance, for each sector, you have um, indicators, outputs, and then numbers in, arranged in cells, and then a target, and, and as time progresses, you put in the actuals, and then you'll be able to see, you know, how close are you to your targets. Now, that, that's a classical dashboard approach. My issue with dashboards is, is partly, partly you know, technical data availability, but it's also, it's also political. It's about how sectors work. Um, you, I mean, a sector is not like an aeroplane. Uh, it's far less mechanical. I'm fine with a dashboard approach if it comes to an aeroplane. I don't want pilots who are going to say, but how do we define safety? And uh, you know, maybe this indicator can be reinterpreted. That's fine. I mean, pilots work according to very strict rules. I'm very happy to fly in their plane. But in a social sector like education, um, there are all sorts of slippery bits. Uh, data can mean different things. There are nearly always comparability problems, even in developed countries. There are comparability problems, even things that we consider gospel like our inflation rate, like our GDP. If you look deeply into that, economists will tell you there are comparability problems. So, and very often those comparability problems influence the way you think about progress, the way you think about achievement in your sector. Um, and th therefore, I mean, the, the, the problem with, 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 with just, just having a, a dashboard uh, is that it it oversimplifies what's going on. And you're going to then get fairly immature kind of, of, of debates. Oh, but look, you know, Mpumalanga didn't reach the, has, is, is the furthest from this target. Mpumalanga bad. Um, whereas there may be very rational explanations as to why Mpumalanga is furthest. Perhaps Mpumalanga is measuring better. Perhaps the other provinces are cheating on their measurements. Um, and those kinds of things you can't capture in, in a very upfront dashboard. The political problem as well is, I mentioned yesterday, that, that in our kind of environment, targets are not set generally. At least sectoral targets are not set by technocrats. They're set politically. Uh, and that's true for, for most developing countries, especially democracies, because governments want to satisfy a, a, an electorate. They want to look ambitious. They want to look as, as if they are promising a lot. And if you then capture very ambitious targets in a, in, 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 in a, in a dashboard, uh, you make yourself look uh, uh, worse. Uh, I'm not saying that one should lie, but just the way one presents one's statistics can uh, make one look unnecessarily uh, fake. And organizations and sectors uh, uh, appear to be failing it it's not good for the people that work there. Um, nobody wants to be in an organization where you work very hard and, 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 and get the information that comes out because you never ever reach any of your targets. What's the alternative? Uh, the alternative, I'm not saying that indicators are unimportant or not useful. They are useful. But I think that what one needs is a, one needs to use indicators as a way of summarizing a a whole narrative about what's happening in the sector. Um, and I, I think that uh, a lot of countries that plan well are able to balance that well, balance indicators with a very good uh, convincing uh, narrative around what's happening. All right, any other, any points or questions about this slide? So this is now complaint one, that, that these structures um, formats kind of constrain us, uh, stop us from, from doing good planning. Um, a 
have a look at, at that one. You're probably familiar with, with that type of problem. In some ways, communism collapsed in, in places like the Soviet Union because, because they tried to over-rationalize uh, uh, production processes um, and failed miserably. So what's the main cause? <clears throat> Sorry? <laughs> the main cause, I mean, what is it? Oh, um, well, what, what this story is telling us is, is <clears throat> I mean, in the Soviet Union, um, there, was, there was an office called Gosplan, which sat in Moscow um, during the communist era, and it would plan the number of shoelaces produced in that factory in that town. It will transport the shoelaces to that shoe factory, which will produce so many by this time, and then you send all of these targets out to uh, uh, publicly employed uh, uh, industrial managers. And that was how the Soviet economy, the Soviet industry, worked to a large extent. Um, and what, what they're saying here is that, that in that in that environment where, where your whole life is driven by indicators, um, you you may get a quota which says you need to produce so many tons of nails every month. And instead of producing lots of nails, you produce one big nail. Uh, it's five tons. Um, it's, it's, it's a way of illustrating something which I'm sure you've, you've, you've discussed a lot, which is that, that indicators can pervert behavior. Um, I mean, in South Africa, I think we have a, 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 a concrete example that's often quoted, and that is uh, metric pass rates in the early 2000s. Uh, during that period, there was a very, very strong emphasis on in, improving uh, pass rates and the result was that schools kept a lot of learners back in grade 11 because there was no indicator around uh, completion of schooling. So, so managers focused on that indicator, pass rate. Let's keep all the weak learners out of grade 12. Uh, and that's not necessarily an optimal outcome. Now, Salvajat is, um, I mean, he's, a, he's a fairly traditional uh, indicator type, um, but, and, and he, he, he likes this uh, metaphor of, of, of the control panel. Um, I, I have no problem with that, uh, as long as one, 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 one does, as, 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 as he suggests, combine uh, indicators with complementary analysis and research cannot have indicators in isolation from everything else. And then the, 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 the response then is don't let indicators dominate the planning and reporting process. Perhaps do this by limiting the number of indicators. And that gets back to this thing that we discussed yesterday. If, if an indicator doesn't tell you enough, what do you do? Do you add more indicators? Well, perhaps a better approach is to, is to not add more indicators, but rather to, to have a a non-indicator analysis where you bring in statistics that you have available at the time that, that explain what is happening with respect to that indicator. Right. All right, complaint two. All right, in a way, we've already discussed this, um, in particular in developing countries with poor data, Poor connectivity, um, it's often impossible to make uh, a reliable year on year comparisons, um, but that doesn't mean that one shouldn't use one's data. One, one needs to use one's data and one needs to interpret it intelligently and, and, and get as much as one can out of the data. 
uh, have a look at this quote again from Inba. What is this about? It's a little bit philosophical. Is, is Inbar being anti-quantitative here? Is he anti-measurement, do you think? Because there are a lot of people who are anti-measurement, especially in education. People who hate data, hate statistics. Is, 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 he, is Inbar one of them? Yeah. Um, I think I think the key, a key word here is is is, uh, is, is over. Okay. Uh, in in bar, I mean, I, I know his book as a whole, and, and he's certainly not against quantitative planning, but he's just saying that 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 um, over sophisticated models are perhaps not that useful. That uh, it's a matter of of of, of not over investing up to front in a lot of modeling and, and rational tools, which perhaps people aren't ready to use, uh, which perhaps don't are, are relevant this year, but won't be relevant next year, because the next year some, somebody's gonna come up with a slightly different way of thinking about educational outcomes, and then the tool won't be valid anymore. Um, there is a secret graveyard in places like the Department of Basic Education. It's a graveyard of many tools and models and Excel spreadsheets and programmed input-output models that have been produced <coughs> over the years. At great cost, um, consultants like them. Um, and, but they're sitting there in graveyards. Uh, they've never been used. Uh, now, some part of the argument, part of the explanation is, well, these officials, they don't, they, they don't have the capacity to use it. I think that's a small part of the explanation. I think very often a large part of the explanation is simply that those tools were inappropriate. Um, and they shouldn't have been initiated in that way in the first place. Um, they were just far too, I mean, just to give you a, a concrete example, um, some Years ago, there, there was an attempt to um, model future provincial expenditure uh, over, I think, 20 years, uh, looking at a huge variety of policy variables, school funding norms, uh, teacher variables, and so on. So essentially, all the costing of education was going to be captured in this tool. The tool was produced but it's never been used. Um, and partly, this is because a lot of those, those variables change every year. Uh, the way the school funding norms work changes, and then once it's changed, people say, oh, no, well, this tool isn't worth it anymore. And it's, it's a huge investment to reorient that, to that entire tool for a few policy changes every year. So what does one do instead? Right. My, my suggestion would be rather to do one's analysis in a s somewhat fragmented way. So in other words, have your analysis, have your spreadsheet tools full of school funding norms. Have your, and, and, and let certain people own those. Have your models for personal expenditure. Have your models for infrastructure. And let different people own those. And then you will need your sectoral people who will try and bring together things and say, but hang on, this is contradicting that and going back. So it's a, it's a dynamic process involving a lot of people uh, rather than reducing everything to one supermodel that's going to uh, tell us everything at the press of a button. I think that, that, that's what, what uh, uh, Inbar is getting at here. Uh, so possible response to complaint two. Indicators can be good. They, they, even if the data are not available, just saying that, look, this is an indicator that we need to track, and getting that indicator approved at a high level can be useful insofar as it then incentivizes um, people to get the data right. And in a sense, that's what's been happening in, in recent years. Presidency has been sa saying, look, we want an indicator on completion of the curriculum in schools. 
And then education responds by saying, oh, but that's very, very difficult to measure. We, we can't do that. And the presidency, which is not an education specialist, says, but there must be a way of doing it. And eventually education finds a way of doing it. Uh, so indicators can incentivize uh, getting the right data. But at the same time, one needs to accept that certain indicators just won't work. Certain indicator proposals uh, just can't be taken forward because they're not uh, practical. Right. Complex three. Um, is about political tradition, um, ambitious targets. Um, this is, we did talk about this earlier. Um, if you try, if you try to fight the politicians and say that, that you can't, you can't have targets like that. They are not uh, rational. Um, you may be fighting a losing battle. It's probably better for you to pay attention to looking at what is, what the current situation is, what different data sources say about the current situation, and making that information available to political principles um, as quickly as possible. And hopefully that will then lead towards more rational uh, uh, target setting. What one can also do is to look at the speed with which other countries right. improve performance against certain indicators. For example, there's quite a lot of work on how, how fast developing countries can improve their learner performance. It's not something that happens overnight, whether we like it or not. Uh, and one can use that kind of analysis to, to bring about more rational uh, targets there. Um, have a look at these two quotes and try and I like the term ritualism. Uh, see, see what you make of that. Lewin, this is taken from, from an interesting document by Lewin on enrollment indicators. Uh, he's done some useful work on how, how typical use of the gross enrollment ratio, net enrollment ratio could be a little bit misleading. He's also done quite a lot of work on South Africa. Um, so, what what does Inba mean when he talks about uh, ritualism? It's, it's, it's about tradition, it's about stating where you stand politically, um, what your aspirations are, and a lot of planning meetings are like that. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with them. You get together and people put up these incredibly ambitious targets. There's no empirical input. Uh, and it's all about feeling that we are the good guys. We're, we're aiming in the right direction. We're being ambitious. We don't worry about our constraints. You know, there, there are no constraints. With political rule, we can get this done. Um, it reminds me of the saying, don't confuse me with the facts. Exactly. Um, now, Inbo's argument is don't fight it. Accept it. Try and integrate it but integrate it in a manner that does not embarrass your organization. Uh, don't let targets set by politicians be put into documents that the Auditor General is going to look at, for instance. Uh, make sure that political targets are placed in more politically oriented documents. And make sure that this there's space for that ritualism, but that there's also space for rational planning. So in other words, if there's a very ambitious target that's been put out there by the politicians, make sure that you as a planner have done the more sober work of saying, so what's actually possible? Because politicians need to be, that's our job, to inform uh, politicians of what's possible. Whether politicians listen to us or not, well, whether they publish what, what, we, what we say is a different question. 
but what we at least want is for the, for the politicians to listen to us. This, this is a point which relates very much to um, kind of more lower level performance indicators, uh, indicators about your directorate or even about you as an individual. Have a look at that. Um, the, key, the key thing is here, managers have a continuous incentive to report modest levels of performance, according to Smith. Um, and uh, it, it, it reminds me of a related issue. Um, I, I, was, I was under a, a performance system once where you had to every year say you know, whether you performed according to your expectations or whether you exceeded your expectations. You probably see, I don't know if the, the public sector one has, has those same terms, exceeded expectations. And um, my problem was that, that uh, what, what that implied was that uh, you, you have a historical kind of level of performance, and obviously you base your, your, your expectations on what you've done in the past, all right? So the only way you can exceed your expectations if you, is if you didn't really understand what you were able, able to do, all right? So you exceed your expectations. But then once you've exceeded your expectations, that becomes the new norm. And in fact, next year, you would expect the same. So you wouldn't exceed your expectations. So to exceed your expectations is something that should be very rare, because it means that you, you haven't really thought through what you're capable of doing. And I used to fight with this performance system, because, that's, because my manager would say, yeah, you did a good job. Put tick exceeded expectations. I said, but I didn't exceed my expectations. This is what I expected to do. No, but just tick it anyway, because it's the top one. <laughs> and nice manager, nice manager. Yes, but but I was being difficult. I was saying, but but that's life. Yeah, I I I, I did what I expected to do. So I should say ex uh, met expectations, not exceeded expectations. Um, so I, I I think that illustrates part of this this. this point, which is that uh, targets often get set uh, as something slightly above what you've already been doing. So some people will game the system and make sure that even if they perform exceptionally in one year, they don't let their managers know. Because that means that I'm, that I'm going to get an even higher target the following year. And this, according to Smith, is one of the things that became endemic in the Soviet Union. People just shied away from success because it just meant that you were going to get hit with even higher targets. Okay, now I, I think another another problem with um, the more kind of aeroplane cockpit type approach to, to indicators is that this, this, this notion, uh, this dashboard notion says that you build the aircraft first and then you fly it whilst reading the dials and indicators. So in other words, you know all the design issues up front. Now, that can get you into trouble when you're doing sector planning because you don't know everything in year one, all right? As, as if there is a year one. There's never really a year one. Uh, but when you want to, want to embark on a, on, on a process of uh, new indicators, um, the textbooks will often tell you, just specify all of the indicators, define all of them, say what the data sources are, what the data quality issues are, and, and then go, right? Then fly this thing. Um, but especially in, in our kind of environment, uh, we just don't have time to learn all the things up front. We, we learn them as we, as, as we fly. Um, and that means that along the way, one needs to adapt one's definitions, and one may even at certain points need to say, oh, actually, this indicator didn't work as, as we calculated. We need to calculate it in a different way, and we need to explain now to the public that we've, we've got a different way of calculating it, and, and th this is the implications. It's, if we want to make a comparison, we have to do X, Y, Z. 
it's a little bit, it's complex. It's not as, as, as straightforward as just a simple uh, dashboard, but it's, it's, it's the reality we, 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 we have to deal with. Um, okay, there's this complaint that we're wasting our time with the indicators because uh, this is the part of our annual performance plans that nobody reads, um, other than perhaps the Auditor General. Uh, no manager reads them. No one uses them for planning, for taking decisions. So what's the point of all of this work? Um, I'd say the response there is not to say indicators should be dropped, but rather that indicators should be uh, better calculated and presented. Before I close, I want to uh, I, I, I want to go through through uh, the final slide, which is a recorded slide. Um, it's partly recorded, you know, in case you want to use this in training that you do with your own staff. Um, so please feel free to do that. Uh, and what I try and do here is to just summarize key things that we have been looking at in our session. Let's hope this works. Let us try now in one slide to summarize a few pointers for best practices when it comes to indicators. When you select indicators, there are two points of departure, the strategy of the organization and the data that are available. A more textbook approach to indicators may say that only your strategy should determine your uh, indicators, but in reality, you need to pay attention to the data that you have available. In fact, when you select indicators, you do need to have a very firm grasp of the data available and the quality of that data. Try to have a mix of innovation and maintenance indicators. Innovation indicators would point to new things. There may be a new early grade reading intervention. You may be tracking the number of children covered. On the other hand, maintenance indicators refer to more ongoing background work. Uh, that must happen all the time. For instance, work relating to teacher pay. If you only have maintenance indicators, you could be giving the impression that you're not paying attention to innovation, that it's business as usual, that you are not going to see any fundamental change. On the other hand, if you only focus on innovation indicators, you could be sending the message that you are not paying sufficient attention to the background work that is necessary for the innovation to be successful. Have few indicators. There are too many reports that have far too many indicators. I think one of the reasons why people overload the indicator side of uh, plans and reports is because there's a sense that all statistics should be expressed in the form of indicators. Now that's definitely not true. There are many other statistics that ought to appear in any uh, report. Uh, indicators are simply the headline statistics, the statistics that you pay particular attention to, uh, that you track over the years, by formalizing too many statistics as indicators, you make plans and reports difficult to follow and a nightmare to produce. When you calculate past values of indicators, don't just use the data to calculate the indicator value. Use the opportunity to do some related analysis uh, using related variables. This will then help you understand the indicator values. Remembering that the indicator is simply like a starting point for a wider analysis. Multiple data sets, for instance school data, household data, may point in different directions. Um, missing data, missing records means that it's difficult sometimes to, to decide exactly what values to use for your indicators. Now this is something that a lot of planners are that uncomfortable with. Um, a lot of managers are uncomfortable with this. There's often a, a, a desire for, for, for indicators to be you know, a mechanical process. Unfortunately, it's not a mechanical process. The reality is that there needs to be some professional judgment and it's, things are never as clean as the textbooks may indicate. Uh, what this means is that one needs to document what decisions one has taken so that one is able to defend the work that one has done afterwards. Target setting, don't torture yourself with politics. Uh, many planners 
get very concerned when uh, target values are set by the politically minded in the organization that seem just very, very high. Now, uh, it's probably not worth it to worry too much about that. Uh, it's the nature of targets. Rather spend your time focusing on what has happened, what is happening, leave the targets to the politicians. However, what you do need to do as, a, as an analyst and planner is to at least document what you believe are the future likely values, very ambitious values, ridiculous values. And if you've got that uh, work done, then hopefully the politicians will be selected very ambitious as opposed to the ridiculous. You need to keep your technical notes whilst you're doing your work. Uh, you or someone else will need them later. And accept that indicator specifications are changing over time. Uh, a textbook approach may say that you put your specifications down right at the start, and then year after year, you simply follow those specifications without changing them. In reality, things are not that clean. One discovers things over time, one gains knowledge about the data, uh, about the different ways of, of, of uh, reflecting the phenomenon that your indicator focuses on, and therefore over time, your specifications will get better. But after some years, one should be seeing more stability. Of course, the important thing is to always be aware of what the indicator values mean for changes over time. You need to be able to explain uh, what the comparability problems are. Very importantly, no indicator values should be presented without accompanying narrative. There should never just be a table of indicator values in a report with no explanation. You need to explain what the comparisons across time and space say. Uh, space here means geographical space, districts, provinces, countries, you need to explain the role of data noise. Are there differences across years? Because you've used sample data and there are wide confidence intervals, in which case those differences don't really mean much. And generally, what do upward and downward movements or no movements mean? Uh, popularly, um, there's this notion that, that indicators should move up if there's progress. If there's no movement up, then there's been no progress. Uh, things are never this straightforward. For instance, you could have an in-service teacher development indicator which does not move up, perhaps not because you're not being successful, but because the demand for teacher development is declining or new teachers moving into the system require less training than older teachers. Does that mean that your indicator is a bad indicator? I would say no. Um, indicators, remember, are less like uh, speedometers on a dashboard and are more just organizing elements in your planning so that you can bring some kind of order to a very complex set of, uh, of issues. The report writer will need to deal with the fact that uh, actuals, what has actually happened is less uh, spectacular than what was put in the targets which tend to be uh, uh, rather ambitious. Now, how does one report on this? Uh, my suggestion is focus on the glass that's half full as opposed to the glass that's half empty. Don't dwell too much on the difference between the actuals and the targets, but rather look at whether the actuals reflect an improvement and whether that improvement is the best that was possible given the time and the resources, and if not, how could one adjust one's strategy in order to uh, achieve better results in future. And then finally, uh, get feedback on your reports. Uh, phone whoever uses your reports, legislators, treasury officials, um, people in the media. Ask about the quality of the report. Ask about the indicators. Were they intelligible? Uh, did they make sense? Did they seem useful? If nobody is bothering about the indicators, despite all the time and effort that you're putting into them, then there's obviously something wrong and you need to go back to the drawing board and there's probably a better way of dealing with this issue. Right, thank you.